measuring magnetic fields that come from living um, organisms it has been of great interest for a long time because there are properties of magnetic fields that are particularly useful for understanding biology and in medicine as well. And one of the main properties is that magnetic fields pass through matter uh, easily without being perturbed or absorbed very much. If you try to go in and measure things optically, you try to go and, and do a normal uh, microscopy with optics, um, you can go in and infrared millimeter or two or three, but you can't go deep inside things. And uh, magnetic fields pass out of bodies or organisms very easily. There are a variety of interesting phenomena which make magnetic fields and are sources of magnetic fields. Most prominently is in MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, where the magnetic fields come from the nuclei, the protons and other nuclei within the molecules within bodies. But there are other sources of magnetic fields. The currents, which are firing in brains and down nerve cells, create magnetic fields. Uh, people who have ever had MEG, network of magnetic sensors around heads, are looking at that sort of thing, but it's also interesting in a biological level. And there are localized nanoscale sources of magnetic fields, which are very important, where you have clusters of often iron-containing compounds that are found naturally and normally in various types of simple organisms and more advanced organisms. We have them, humans have them in our bodies, as do very, a wide variety of organisms. It can be related to disease as well. Sometimes the use of iron and other metals inside organisms go awry, and one gets larger clusters of these compounds, often creating, uh, instead of just at the few atom level or a few nanometers, becoming tens or hundreds of nanometers in size, or microns, this can build up into plaques, which can cause malfunction in, sorts of, in, in all sorts of organisms. A prominent example is something like Alzheimer's in the brain. So, uh, there are a lot of reasons why people are interested in being able to measure magnetic fields that come from living organisms. One of the challenges is that magnetic fields, the flip side of them not being absorbed and passing through things, is that they are weak and hard to detect. Something like conventional MRI is able to detect magnetic fields in samples down to about a one cubic millimeter or a little bit smaller. That sounds like a small size it is compared to a whole human body, but if you're looking at one individual cell, it's much larger than one individual cell. It would have thousands of, uh, of cells in, in such a small volume, uh, or, or millions, depending on the size of cells. And if you want to look at structures within cells, you want to look at the cell nucleus, or cell walls, or ribosomes, or mitochondria, or other kind of processes that are going on inside of cells, forget it. Conventional MRI of that uh, type that we see in hospitals, et cetera, can come nowhere close to doing the job. So people have been interested, myself included, in, in developing new measurement tools which can non-invasively probe and measure magnetic fields in living organisms, living cells, down in very small scales, down to the single cell size, which is usually a few, few microns, and below that, micron is a, is a millionth of a meter, down inside, well inside the cell, down to the nanoscale, billionth of a meter. And so, uh, uh, my colleagues and I have developed a technology in, which looks very promising for this sort of application. And it involves, again, understanding the basic quantum physics of, of atoms, in this case, nitrogen atoms and a missing carbon atom frozen into a diamond lattice. That's our type of magnetic sensor that we use. And some, this, is, this nitrogen and a missing carbon atom in a diamond uh, lattice, the missing carbon atom is some kind, sometimes called a vacancy. And so we call this a nitrogen vacancy, or for shorthand, NV color center in diamond. These NV color centers in diamond when, when they exist at high density are what give diamond naturally a pink color. So they're naturally occurring phenomena in diamonds, although we can manufacture diamond to have these particular defects in them. This could be a bulk diamond, the sort out of which you could make a gemstone, or it could be very small, specially crafted nano diamonds, nano diamonds that are more spherical or that pillars, etc., designed to be able to go into cells or go near to cells and have this NV center which has very special properties to be able to be used as your magnetic field probe. Its special properties are quantum mechanical properties. It gives off, it absorbs green light and emits red light, and the red light that it emits in the NV center is a strong function of the local magnetic field that it has. And in fact, it has quantum mechanical energy levels 
uh, associated with it are a spin or a permanent angular momentum, which are sensitive to magnetic fields. So the rate at which the spin or the magnetic moment of the NV rotates is a function of the local magnetic fields. So let's say you had a diamond chip and you had one of these NV centers near the surface or several of them. It's going to absorb green light and emit red light as a, a, a strong function of the local magnetic field, as I said. Let's say that NV center is just a few nanometers below the surface of the diamond chip. You can plunk on top of it a series of living cells. It could be living tissue. It could be individual cells, such as bacteria, et cetera. If those cells are giving off magnetic fields, this NV center is a probe right up next to it and can be a little sensor. It's localized. It's just an angstrom or two in size, which is a tenth of a nanometer. So it is a very local source to measure the magnetic fields. And since it emits light, we can image the, the uh, essentially image the magnetic fields that are being uh, at that nanoscale by measuring the light. And so what we've been able to do is take, for example, diamond chips with many NV, sayer, NV centers in a surface layer, have a population of living cells on top, creating magnetic fields in a variety of interesting ways, and then image those magnetic fields onto a camera, like a CCD array or a CMOS array, uh, using conventional optics. It works very well. The green light we use to, to absorb by the NV centers can be injected in a way that does not get into the cells and doesn't harm them. So it's a very non-invasive, a uh, widely applicable tool for measuring magnetic fields. You can also synthesize, as I mentioned before, instead of just a bulk diamond chip, little diamond probes, little nanoparticles, which can go into cells, live inside of cells, and be targeted by, with surface functionalization to go at the particular part of a cell that you're interested in. Perhaps you're interested, again, something like the mitochondria, where there's some respiration going on, or the cell wall, or cell, uh, cell nucleus, or other sorts of structures. This, these nanoparticles can be functionalized to target those places. You can go in with uh, green light, read off the red light, which can be a measure of the local magnetic field inside. The NV centers also have the ability to measure temperature locally and electric fields locally. So there are a wonderful little quantum probe, taking advantage of the quantum mechanical properties of a nitrogen atom and a missing carbon atom right next to each other, uh, to be able to measure magnetic fields, electric fields, and temperature in living, in living um, organisms. A specific example of something we've done fairly recently, it's probably just the first stage in many things that can be possible, is to take a type of bacteria known as magnetotactic bacteria. These are ancient organisms, ancient in the sense that we're, they're believed to have evolved about two billion years ago. The prokaryotes, which means they don't even have a cell nucleus, so they're kinds of bacteria. And amazingly, they naturally synthesize magnetic nanoparticles, each about 50 nanometers in size, one after another. And they're little, like little magnets, and they're able to line a, a whole series of them, maybe 10, 20, 30 of them up inside their bodies along a chain, a filament, a protein, like a compass needle. So there's a series of these. They form a compass needle inside the bacteria, which is only about two microns long. The bacteria has a flagellum. It swims. And this compass needle helps navigate the bacterium to want to go down in ponds. So there are many species of these types of bacteria. They're very common around the world. There's a pond nearby here, our lab in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where we can find them. And they like going down where the oxygen level is low because they're anaerobes. They, don't, they try to go into environments with low oxygen. In the northern hemisphere, they synthesize the magnetic uh, axis aligned opposite of the southern hemisphere so they can navigate properly in these two hemispheres. Amazing things. They can synthesize magnetic nanoparticles more perfectly than we humans can in our nanosynthesis, at least to date. How are they able to do this? What are the genes that control this sort of thing? How perfectly aligned are they? To date, people could look at them in electron microscopes, find these nanoparticles, but they couldn't take the living bacteria and study them with high enough resolution before our work to see inside the cells and see the magnetic field patterns inside. The other existing magnetic field sensors, whether it was MRI or other sensors, had too coarse spatial resolution. Now with our technology, we can peer deep inside these cells and see the patterns of magnetic fields. And we're in the midst with our collaborators of studying how when you change the environment or change certain uh, genes in, in a controllable way or different subpopulations of these species, uh, what happens to their ability to synthesize these, essentially these chain of nanoparticles, these little compass needles? What happens when a cell divides? Does one daughter cell get all the, the nanoparticles and the compass needle and the other one has to synthesize new ones? Or do they split it somehow? The genes, it turns out, that control the synthesis and some of the behavior of the nanoparticles inside these magnetotactic bacteria, some of the same genes are found in higher organisms, like humans and other kinds of higher organisms. 
Do they play a role in regulating the use of iron in our body in some way that's maybe not about us mag having compass needles and, and navigating? Maybe they do for, for things like passenger pigeons or whatnot, but maybe they are relevant to uh, other things that go on in our bodies in terms of uh, cell behavior, even in, uh, when they go awry in terms of disease. Many open questions, but we couldn't begin to address these magnetic properties of these, uh, these species until we had the measurement tools to be able to see inside them non-invasively while they're alive. And these quantum defects known as these nitrogen vacancy or NV color centers in diamond is one way to do that. It's a nice example of how pushing measurement technology has, has opened up a new window and being able to see literally inside of living organisms. We hope in the future, and the community hopes in the future, to be able to apply this sort of technology to, to a wide range of, of uh, studies of, of, of both simple bacteria and more complicated uh, cells. Perhaps we'll be able to look at firing neurons, networks of brain cells, and be able to see the magnetic field patterns that come from them, uh, both in simple neuronal circuits placed onto a diamond chip and eventually with quantum diamond probes uh, going into, into brains to be able to understand uh, how brains operate well. So um, there is a lot of opportunity being able to push the, the ability to measure things very well down to the nanoscale, taking advantage of quantum physics, such as being able to measure magnetic fields that come from many sources in living cells. And that's uh, what we're working on. Currently, one of the challenges uh, of this sort of technology of these quantum defects in diamond is that um, in the planar diamond chips with the, with the NV centers at the surface, we can measure magnetic fields or electric fields or temperature very well in two-dimensional systems that sit right on the surface. And I've mentioned how we can fabricate nanoparticles of various shapes to go into cells, but that does not has, help us get the light back out from these emitters if they're deep inside of cells. So we still have the same sort of limitations that you'd have of any kind of opti mic optical microscopy in the third dimension that is trying to get the light out more than, let's say, a millimeter. So if you wanted a true macroscopic organism, not just human brains, but some, you don't have to be that big, or human bodies, but anything that's beyond about a millimeter in size in that third dimension, and there's a 2D plane, but going up in the third dimension, uh, since the signal from these defects comes out as light, as optical light, it will be absorbed and scattered by tissue that's in the way. So one of the challenges is to figure out a way to bring that information out. It may involve, instead of just nanodiamonds, which are spherical type things or, or, or sort of like boulders, instead constructed to be more like uh, very narrow needles in which the sensors would be at the tip and then you could pierce in like a needle in to, to probe. That's still somewhat invasive because it involves probing in, but that's one of our challenges. It's one of our challenges. Another challenge is to be able to have, if we want true sub-nanometer scale, we want to get down to the angstrom scale, being able to measure individual spins, electronic and nuclear spins inside of molecules. Let's say beyond going well below living cells, we want to look at individual biomolecules. We want to map one uh, atom at a time in DNA or something like this or some sort of uh, other biomolecule. That may be possible with this technology, but it's going to require being able to put the nitrogen vacancy centers very close to the surface of the diamond and not corrupt their properties. Why? Because the magnetic fields that come from the source, like from the spinning nuclei within a molecule, the strength of those fields fall off rapidly as you move away. They really fall off as one over the separation cubed. So you, the closer you get, the stronger the fields are. If you have this NV center deep inside the diamond, and here's your thing to be studied, it's far enough away that the fields are very weak and can't be, can't be studied. So a real challenge is to learn how to place, whether it be in bulk diamonds or in nano diamonds, put these little sensors within one nanometer or less of the surface while, without corrupting their behavior. So they can get really close to be able to, uh, to sense things. <laughs>